He has risen. He has risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Greetings in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is great to be in God's house with you this morning to celebrate Easter once again. And today we are going to be looking at the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to be considering the theme, Walk by Faith. Now, the Gospel of Mark is very interesting in its uh, accounting of the events of the resurrection. And one of the interesting pieces of the account of the resurrection, according to the Gospel of Mark, actually uh, is, is uh, uh, prepared for us two chapters earlier in Mark chapter 14. And uh, in Mark chapter 14, we read about a very interesting thing that happened, and that is that there was one of the disciples who in his haste to flee those who had come to take Jesus away, that in his haste to flee, that he uh, ran out of his clothes, literally. They grabbed a hold of him, they grabbed a hold of, of, his, of his garment, and he struggled, and he fought, and, and he was such was his desire to get away from those who had come to capture Jesus that he literally ran off naked into the night. And it's interesting when you look at the Gospel of Mark, because Mark uh, is very careful, he pay, pays great attention to the choice of words that he uses, and it says there that his linen cloth he left behind. And what's interesting about this is that Mark only uses this phrase, linen cloth, one other time in Scripture. And where is that? In the very next chapter, in Mark chapter 15, when it describes Jesus' burial. And so we don't know if Jesus is buried with a cloth that was left behind from the disciple, or if perhaps Mark is using literary license under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to make a greater theological point, which is what? That Jesus is wrapped in our shame. He came and he died on the cross to pay for our sins. He took all the sins of the world upon him, including those of those closest to him in his own group. And perhaps also, as many have speculated over the years, that Mark is actually talking about who in this account? Himself. And so this may be a self-portrait here, if you will. But there's more to this, because we see then that when the women get to the tomb, there's a, a young man, is how it's described. And he's in white robes, right? You can sort of see where this is going, perhaps. And what's interesting is that the way the women respond to this young man is that it seems like how people respond to angels, but not exactly. They don't respond with an overwhelming fear, and the clothing of this individual is not dazzling white, as it's usually described, a, a blinding brilliance. It's, it's not quite that. And so then that has led uh, people to consider this fact, that the young man who flees naked at Jesus' arrest is perhaps also the young man now clothed in the tomb. And why might we think that from a scriptural point of view? Because once again, Mark is very careful in his choice of Greek words. And it's the same Greek word regarding this man in Mark 14 as it is in Mark 16. And so this has led people to speculate that perhaps this is really a one-sentence parable, if you will. And what would the point of that parable be? that this shows the stripping away which all the disciples are going through between Christ's crucifixion and his resurrection. And now this young man who fled naked is what himself? He is clothed. He is clothed wonderfully in Christ's righteousness. But I think if we're going to look at the account of Mark today, we have, to, we have to consider this question. Why did the women think that Jesus was still dead? Because clearly they do. They're dragging an untold weight of spices to the tomb. In fact, they bought these spices the night before, right, right after sundown. If you've ever been to the Middle East, you know that when sundown comes, that's when people come out and go shopping. It's just a lot cooler. The Sabbath day is now over, so they're not breaking Jewish law. 
which really is quite something if you think about it, because they had just put Jesus in, ground, in the ground the day before, right, on Friday, and they had anointed him, which Scripture says, with 75 pounds of spices and, and aloe. And so now they're going out the very next day, in the evening, then after sundown, and they're buying more, so that then they are prepared first thing in the morning. And they wouldn't have done all of this if they thought that Jesus was what? Alive. And so why is this? I want to share with you a little bit here this morning. The Orthodox Jewish people still to this day believe in the resurrection. They believe in a resurrection, but they believe that it will be a general resurrection where all will be raised on the last day. That is the, still the belief of Orthodox Jews today. And it ought to sound pretty familiar because guess who also believes there's going to be a general resurrection on the dead last day? We do. That's exactly right. And we see this faith, this perception of the resurrection, in the words of Martha, for example, when Lazarus has died, right? And she confronts Jesus and says, if you had been here, he would not have died. And then Jesus uh, says to her uh, in John chapter 11, your brother will rise again. And Martha responds to Jesus with saying what? I know that he will rise again. Now watch her words closely. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection when? On the last day. And in fact, Jesus affirms this teaching because he speaks of the resurrection that will happen on the last day. In the Gospel of John, chapter 6, there's four times packed right in there, very close to each other, where he uses that phrase, the general resurrection, he talks about the general resurrection, and he says it will happen on the last day. But having said that, Jesus also taught his disciples repeatedly, repeatedly, that he was going to be raised when? On the third day. And what's interesting about Jesus' resurrection, if you stop and think about it, is that what is the third day? It is the Feast of First Fruits. So in Jesus' death and in his resurrection, there are three Jewish feasts that are covered in this brief time period. There's the Feast of the Passover, there's the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, and there's the Feast of First Fruits. And that's why Jesus is called the first fruit to be raised from the dead, right? It's so powerful. Now, the question comes up, was the resurrection taught in the Old Testament? Or is this just a New Testament idea? And the truth of the matter is that the resurrection is found throughout the Old Testament, both in the teachings and in the stories that are recorded for us. Let me share a couple of them with you. From Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19, a couple of scriptures real quickly. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise, the earth will give birth to the dead. From Daniel chapter 12. Those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life. This ought to sound pretty familiar to us, right? Some to shame and everlasting condemn. There's going to be a judgment on the last day. And then Ezekiel chapter 37, the famous Valley of Bones uh, chapter. And part of it there says that the Spirit of the Lord sent me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And it talks then about how in this vision that all these bones are connected back together, sinew, and they come to life. But not only is it taught in the Old Testament, but it's also recorded in the Old Testament. And I want to just uh, bring something out here for you. Because there's three in particular I want to look at. The first has to do with Elijah raising somebody from the dead. And that was the widow of Zarephath's son. You remember quickly, you remember Elijah was befriended and taken care of by, by the widow of Zarephath. Her son dies. And so then Elijah raises him from the dead. And how does he do it? He spreads himself out upon him, is what it describes in scripture. And then he comes back to life. And then Elijah's successor, Elisha, it's always very easy to remember the two in their proper order because S follows J. So it's Elijah and then it's Elisha. And so then Elisha then, in his ministry at some point, then he's befriended uh, by a woman who supports him in his ministry. But then her son uh, passes away. And so then Elisha raises him from the dead. And how does he do it? In the very similar way that Elijah spreads himself out upon the sun, but then it says that he breathed into his mouth and he came back to life. And then there's a third time of somebody being raised from the dead that I want to draw to your attention this morning. And that is uh, the man who was thrown into Elisha's grave. This is kind of an interesting story. So Elisha has been buried, and the Israelites are about their business, and an unknown person has passed away, 
the Moabites come and attack Israel. And so then the people who are there, they, they want this person's body to be protected. And so back in those days, the dead were buried in a cave. So then they took the body of this unnamed person, and in their haste, they literally, it says, threw him into the cave. When they chuck him into the cave, he lands on top of Elisha. And the scripture records for us that then when, he, uh, when his body landed on top of Elisha's body, who had been uh, passed away for some time, then this man, then he comes to life. And so this is a verse that, that many people then have used as justification for, for venerating the bones of the saints. And they'll say, see, this is what happens. This is why the bones of the saints are so powerful. But Martin Kevnitz in the Council of Trent said this regarding this thought and this passage. That first of all, that the uh, bones of Elisha were never then taken and paraded around and held before people or sold off to people. That if you buy this, then you have something that will do this other thing for you. Nor was it ever the intent of the people who threw that body into the cave that this would happen. And so then what is the real lesson here? That Elisha, who faithfully proclaimed the word of God, even in his death, was a proclaimer of the power of God as well. Amen? Amen. And so then what would we gain from the text at hand? Well, the women clearly have doubts, right? Uh, we, we sort of covered that. The women had doubts, and this is something that we should all be familiar with if we're honest with ourselves. But even having had their doubts, they still trust God. And so, and they are active in their faith. I mean, let's give them some credit, right? They make it a priority to get the uh, spices arranged immediately at the first opportunity. And now they're making it a priority to go and anoint their Savior. This is their beloved rabbi. They're going to anoint him at the very first opportunity that they have. And, you know, it's not always easy to walk by faith in this world, right? I mean, if you, if, if you have a child who, who uh, comes to you earlier than maybe you had originally planned to have this child, whatever the circumstances might be, you're going to face a lot, of, a lot of questions, a lot of doubts, a lot of concern. It's not always easy to walk by faith. It's easy to talk about it. It's fairly easy to encourage other people in it. But to actually do it ourselves today, if you see these women walking by faith, let us also be encouraged. You know, it's, it's not always easy to take time for worship when you've already worked a 60-hour week. It's not always easy to walk by faith. It's not always easy to stay with a spouse who struggles in one way or another. It's easier to make a different decision. It's not easy. But here's the thing I want to encourage you with today. Fear exists where Jesus is not. Fear exists where Jesus is. So if you're facing a struggle in your life, and quite honestly, you are a loved one is facing fear, then remember these words, that fear exists where Jesus isn't. And so call upon the name of Jesus, and turn to him, and trust in him, and seek him out to guide you through this time, and believe his words of grace and mercy to you and to yours. What's the big idea today? That we would walk by faith. That these women and their faith would inspire us also. And I think scripture is full of these examples. We, we look at the women here today. That we see that when you meet Jesus, your load gets lighter. When you meet Jesus, your load gets lighter. Those women drug those spices to go to the tomb. I can promise you this. They didn't take them back. <laughs> you know, it gets hot in the Middle East, right? They left that stuff. They didn't need it anymore. When you meet Jesus, your load gets lighter. You know, there's a famous account of the, the woman at the well who has to go to the well in the middle of the day because she's not good enough to be with the other women when they go in the morning. And so she's dragging her water jar, Scripture tells us. She goes, she goes to the well, and who does she run into? She runs into Jesus. And I make a long story short, Jesus shares God's grace and God's mercy with her. And one of the outcomes of this is what? I love this part of the story. It says that she left her water jar at the well. And she went and she told everybody. She left behind what she had come there with. When you meet Jesus, your load gets lighter. You're going to have a chance to meet Jesus this morning. You're going to have a chance in the Lord's table. You're going to come to the Lord's table. You're going to receive Christ's body and blood. And you're going to receive it for a purpose. Because Jesus says when you receive his body and his blood, that then your sins are forgiven. And so then your load is going to get lightened this morning by your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
The good news is that God makes all of this so, so easy. In Romans chapter 10, it says that if you confess, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you'll but believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, that then you will be saved. And I want to invite everybody who's here and everybody who's watching to be in this relationship with our Father through his Son. It's so simple. You just have to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead. And then you will have the gift of eternal life and his grace that forgives all sin. Jesus doesn't want you to be burdened. He said in another place, come unto me all you who are weary and heavy burdened. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is easy, and my load is light. We've got a great mission statement as a church, that we're going to glorify God by spreading the gospel, right? And we're going to do this in our preaching, our teaching, and in, what's the third one, guys? <laughs> Living our daily lives. That's exactly right. And clearly in the text of today, we see this. We see what it is to walk by faith, to live out your daily life trusting God. In your Savior, not always understanding everything. And so I love these instructions that this angelic messenger, whether it was Mark or whether it was an angel, this, an angel simply means a messenger, by the way. That then at the end there, here of our reading, I love how it says this, right? He says to the women, go and tell his disciples and Peter. <laughs> you catch that? Separates out, highlights Peter. Not to put Peter down, not to make Peter feel, Peter feel bad, but why? Because Peter had denied Jesus three times. And so, and so God wants all the disciples, and especially perhaps Peter also, to know that Jesus has been raised from the dead and that he is wanted in this relationship on an ongoing basis. The walk by faith is not always what we would expect it to be, right? Because we are called to walk by faith in a world that does not live by faith. We've got a picture here of a, of a street in Germany. And it's kind of interesting, the name of the street. Because what it means in German is the way of the cross. You might say the stations of the cross. The way of the cross, that's the name of this street here that you see in Germany. The way of the cross. And, and you might say, well, that's just so wonderful. The way of the cross, they, they named a street, a public street, after this. That's just fantastic. And, it, and you know, it's great, right? I don't know if you can make out the business that's in the background of this picture. The business that's in the background of this picture is a, a business that caters to certain desires of mostly male patrons. <clears throat> I'm just going to say that. And so here on this street, you have the way of the cross, and you have this business publicly right there. And, and, and you know, there are some who would say, well, that's, that's horrible, and that certainly is not God's plan. And there are some who say that this sign doesn't belong, and, and you'd be wrong. The sign, the sign is fine just the way it is. And even if that sign isn't there, it's still the way of the cross, brothers and sisters. It's still the way of the cross to walk in a world that's fallen, that we would share the good news with those around us. It's so easy to share the political news and the economic news and the sporting news and whatever else. But that's not our news station. We're called to share the good news that we would help people to walk by faith also. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.